All right, we're on the air. So we can either wait for a few people to join or we can just go for it. Okay. So uh, I might just give it a minute normally just to make sure everything's working on this side. All right, so the stream is good. All right, it looks like we're good to go. Excellent. So we've already got two people watching, so that's a good sign. Okay. <laughs> that's probably us too. <laughs> yeah, 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 it could be. No, it populates pretty quickly, so already up to seven, so that's good. So welcome, folks. We're doing a live hangout here with Ross Helmot, who I was pronouncing Helmont last time, just through. <laughs> yeah, I was. I couldn't believe it. I've known you like 20 years, and I, I was pronouncing your last name wrong. I, I, I'm the one that usually gets the name pronounced wrong, so... Yeah. Ross is a professional guitar teacher. He's been teaching guitar for 30 plus years and also playing live. He's one of my top three favorite players in Melbourne and I've pinched a few licks of, off him over the years. So uh, we're here to have a chat about theory. He's also just released a book which is available online about practice, oh, like all kinds of techniques and theory about guitar, but stuff you can actually use in real life. <laughs> so I guess that's a good thing to uh, maybe start on. We were talking earlier about things you can take, basic theory that can actually apply to real life situation, situations, even for beginners. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts on how theory can help or improve your understanding of even basic music. Yeah, okay, Shane. The reason I wrote the book is, um, you know, through my teaching and, and talking to a lot of players out there, there's still a lot of guys um, I've found have been playing for you know thirty years or longer. You know, some guys are retired. They played when they were kids, and uh, you know they've still been playing all along. But they still don't know some basic sort of stuff that helps them to help them get any further. And um, so I thought, and what I found is a lot of people are scared of the idea. When you mention the word theory, they get pretty scared of it. And um, it's not something to be scared of. It's just something. You need some basics to understanding rather than just knowing some, some chords and a couple of scales, just to understand how the scale's built, how the chord's built, because then it helps you to, um, to, to grow your own knowledge so that you can then, um, then you can improve your playing. You don't, um, what was I going to say, you can, you, can, you, can become, you can become a better player if you know the basics to help you get there. So there's a lot of guys that are frustrated out there and a lot of the same guys are the same guys that you know are scared of learning any knowledge or getting any theory. If you get some basic theory, you can improve your playing. So that, that's that's the basic premise anyway. What do you say to the hardcore feel players who say, "I don't need to know any of that stuff. I can just wing it." Yeah, well, <laughs> play, yeah. play with feel. It's pretty limiting, hey? Yeah, it is pretty limiting, and it's the same as same as some guys that. Um, you know, I used to get people would say, oh, yeah, but I don't need lessons. Stevie Ray Vaughan didn't have lessons. Well, you know, you and I know that that's not really true. I mean, he didn't have formal lessons, but he certainly was lucky to be in Texas at a time when people like Albert King were hanging around that gave him a few tips. Now, yeah, the last yeah. time I looked down a box, hill, Albert King wasn't hanging around down there to give anyone any tips. So, <laughs> so you need to, you know, any knowledge you can get is valuable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And... um yeah, also being surrounded by quality players too is a, obviously a huge. You can, you learn a little bit from everybody as well in in you know when you're out playing and all that kind of stuff. So, I guess uh, tell us a little bit about you know what your book sort of focuses on and and all that kind of stuff in terms of is it for everybody? Is it aimed at beginners, intermediates, or just anyone who wants to get a broader knowledge of you know the guitar? Anyone, basically? Yeah, anyone that hasn't got a basic knowledge, you know. Um, and, and that can be beginners. Well, it'd be beginners, intermediates. You know, players have been playing for quite a while. You know, they might consider themselves experienced players. They might be experienced time-wise, but they're not that experienced knowledge-wise. You know, so it's really it's not difficult. It's nothing about you know having to arrange you know for a full symphony orchestra or harmonise all you know um, hard intervals and things like that. It's really just basic stuff. For it, it goes through and explains where the where the scale comes from. What a pentatonic scale is, yeah. um, how how the scales go to create your chords, basic chords. From your basic chords, how you can create a chord progression. So when people start talking numbers one four five, you know one six two five, and that sort of thing, you'll then understand what that is. 
and and then it talks about that some of the basic progressions like those that, that are used in songs so as, as we know a lot of songs have got the same chord progressions and so if you're trying to learn a whole heap of songs if you understand a lot of them are kind of the same maybe just in different keys it really helps you know people think oh you know 12 bar blues it's all the same but a lot of pop songs and rock songs are exactly the same too they use the same formulas so yeah. if you understand the formulas then then you can um you know then you can get moving it helps you to learn stuff quicker i, w I wrote this really great song on my last album which is the same as with or without you or you know under the bridge or there's about yeah. five thousand great four chord songs or four chord verse songs out there so yeah it's pretty sweet so we've actually got uh, some people in the chat. I just wanted to say hi to a few people. We've got Alex Mark from Mark's Naughty Guitars, Ahmad Kareem, and we've got Rector Gaming. <laughs> okay. Happy birthday, mate. I just uh, thought I should give him a shout out there. And this is a QA and a too. So if we touch on any topics and you have any questions about um, guitar theory, Ross is the master. So uh, at least in my part of the world anyway. So feel free to ask any questions this isn't so much a gear talk thing tonight we're actually talking guitar but it is a q a and it may end up on a podcast as well so if you do have any questions feel free to ask away so that uh, number system that 145 for example yeah is it, that's called a nashville number system is that correct uh, not not necessarily i mean nashville use a number system and um they've used it for a while but the number system has been used to analyze music you know, for, for pretty much time, you know, time immemorial. It's in classical music, they use Roman numeral system. Cool. Um, in the Nashville system, they use this plain number system. It's used a little bit differently. You know, um, what they, I think it was actually the guy from the Jordanaires that came up with that system originally. He used it for vocal harmonies. But oh, then the, then the, then the, um, the um, musicians decided it was a good method to write out quick chord charts. So, you know, they, there's not such a formal system, but each player has his own way of writing his chart by using the numbers. And then you, by using the numbers, that, then if the singer comes in and says, oh, I don't want to sing in that key, it doesn't matter. They can play in any key that they want. It's just they use the numbers to relate back to it. So the difference in Nashville when they were recording to, say, LA, when they were recording, LA used to use a whole lot of charts, you know, the, you know proper charts, notation and chord charts. So if the singer came and said, I'm not doing it in B flat, I want to do it in G, well, then it had to go back to the music copyist and get rewritten and it might take a couple of days for the chart to get back. Whereas in Nashville, they go, yep, sure, off we go. And so Nashville was renowned for, you know, churning out stuff pretty quickly. And yeah. That, num that number system is used a lot around the world now. It's sort of, it's grown out of Nashville. And, of course, a lot of people use it here. And, um, you yeah. know, of course, with everything, people try to formalise it, but it's, it's really an informal system of just writing numbers down. Yeah, yeah, cool. So let me bring up your uh, website here so we can take a look. This is Ross's uh, website here. So if you're in Melbourne, Australia, or even if you're not and you're interested in, in, in his book, I'm guessing you could find some details on it here as well. Um, I also do have some pictures of the cover, which I can't quite share just yet because I have to move the file. <laughs> yeah. If you can scroll down a bit, you'll find the um, the books just under there. Yeah, there's a little limit. Oh, there we go. Cool. There. And you might notice a photo under there. I was playing with some dodgy band in Collingwood or Richmond one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, I saw that photo earlier actually. Yeah. And I thought, I've, I've got that photo somewhere on my computer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, back in the early days of me playing live, man. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, it was back back a few days or a few years now. Yeah, yeah. Far the, out. If you click on the book on the website, there's a link through to, to, to Amazon and, and there's a preview there. So if anyone's interested, they can click through there and um, and have a look there. Um, oh, wow. $7.55. That's yeah. that's awesome. Cool. Very nice. So, yeah, you can check it out on Amazon or you can go to rosshelmot.com.au yeah. and uh, with no N. <laughs> No, no, and no, no. I know it's just spelled it right there, mate. That's the main thing. Yeah, I've always known how to spell it. I think I was just pronouncing it with an N for some reason yeah. uh, in, in there. So sorry about that, mate. This is one of those days. Kicking myself after I did that last time. But uh, yeah, so I guess we can have a chat about um, even even basic theory like uh, like the 145. A lot of guys that, listen, that you know enjoy the channel or whatever here in the blues might not know exactly what that means. So maybe you could just um, 
share a little knowledge on on maybe that topic if if you would like yeah. to. Yeah, look, it's it's really um, in it, it, it's. It's built. It's in a scale. So if you've got sort of a C major scale, it's always easy to work from C. Yeah, we've got seven notes: C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and C. Oh, that gives you the eighth note, your octave. Okay. So you've got chords built off of the, each of those notes. So the the one four five progression is the chord built off the first degree, which is C. The E F is four, and G is five. So it's the C chord, the F chord, and the G chord. So there's your one four five progression. So if we change keys, um, in the case of, say, we went to the key of D, and we've still got one, four, five, we've got D, E, F sharp, G, A. So D, G, A is now our one, four, five. So the relationship of the notes in the chord, or the, the, the notes in the, in the progression, or the chords in progression are the same. The one chord, the four chord, and the five chord. So that, that's why numbers are really handy to know. You just, you just say, look, it's just a one, four, five in the key of G. And, and then most musicians should know what it is. Yeah. If it's, if it's a blues, we put a seven on there. So, you know, we, what I mean by seven, it's a dominant chord. So it might be, um, you know, the C7, an F7, and a G7. Cool, cool. Yeah. And I guess a lot of the theory will uh, sort of tie in with shapes and stuff that people will already know on the guitar, which is yeah. something that you like light bulb moments go off sometimes when you actually do learn something. Uh, well, yeah, actually, one of, one of the things um, for, for the beginners, you know, talk about beginners before, and we start off with what, what's a chromatic scale. Well, chromatic scale is all of the notes on the, on the fretboard, on, you know, all of the notes. So if we go up one string with E, F, F sharp, G, etc. So when you're learning bar chords or learning movable shapes, you've got to load the, the notes on the guitar. So by knowing the chromatic scale, you can then start counting up and find those notes on the, on the sixth string or the fifth string, as so long as you know where you're starting. So long as you know it's an E string or an A string. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. I had some guys that want to learn, you know, they're saying, oh, I, I'm trying to learn the fretboard. And I said, well, what are you doing? And so I've got this chart and I'm sitting there learning all the notes on the chart. I said, it's just not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you've got to apply stuff if you don't apply it. So the easy way to understand the chromatic scale helps to find the note. Yeah. But the other way is when you land on a note somewhere, try and figure out what it is. Don't spend all the time looking at a chart, though. It's not going to work for you. So why do you think some people have, um, I guess, a fear of learning theory? Do you, do you think it might, they might feel like it will take away or send them backwards slightly before they go forwards? Or what, what do you think about, you know, people's fear of learning uh, some theory? Some theory. And th um, what you said before, some people have got this idea about um, theory and... Um, taking away creativity and, and there's nothing that could be further than the truth, you know. The most creative players in the world have known an enormous amount of theory. I mean, you know, if you go through the, the jazz history of the people like Miles Davis and Charlie Parker and John Coltrane, you know, some of the greatest musicians of the 20th century and, and most, you know, creative musicians, they created new styles of music. You know, that's as creative as you can get. You know, I mean, they, they didn't go in ignorant. They didn't go in ignorant at all. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, there's some great players in the in the bluegrass field, you know, and some of the guys that came into Nashville, they they um you know they did have a great feel for it, and they you know like I remember Mark O'Connor, I think it was the great fiddle player and and guitar player, and saying when he first got to Nashville, he didn't understand the number system, but he realised he had to learn it really quickly, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise he wouldn't get the work that he was getting. They could play, he could play like like crazy, but he still needed to understand this system, and I don't think it really hurt his creativity to understand it at all. No, no, I think you're absolutely right. When I got to play in San Francisco, I played it with a band called the Smoke Daddies for a little while, and um, they used that exclusively. And at the start, I was like, what the hell's going on here? Like, I knew the 145, but I was like, what's a two or a minor yeah. two? I was like, hang on a second. <laughs> so then I, I sort of worked out, okay, so this is just a couple of frets up. Uh, this is not anywhere near as hard as... What I thought there was some, you know, it took, did take me a little while to get in the feel for it, but yeah, um, I don't use it enough now. But it is a great thing to learn, and especially when you, yeah, rather than remembering chords, sometimes numbers are easier to remember for some people too, and I think that's a, a huge advantage. I got asked a pretty funny question here. I'm not sure who this is, but they said, uh, "Can you ask Ross why he doesn't wear that snazzy jacket when I come for lessons?" 
<laughs> Who said that? <laughs> it's uh, an account called Skater Mum, but I, I'm guessing that's a uh, alias for someone else that you teach. So uh, I got a feeling I might know who it is, but I'm I'm not sure. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, yeah, Sh Shane just put it on me. This is a video that I had. To, I, you know, I was going to go on the video. I didn't think it was going to happen, so I had to grab a jacket out of my cupboard. <laughs> yeah. This. Uh, with uh, Ross thought we were doing an audio podcast, which I guess we are in some way as well. But yeah. the video things good, and we can also take uh, take some questions. So if anyone has some questions, Alex, actually Alex uh, Lisa or Leza has a question. He says, "How do you get into the blues? As in, how do you get into playing blues? What's the what are some of the the things you would want to learn first if you were approaching?" I think the first thing you'd want to do is learn the one four five progression, really, with the basic basic blues progression, some mm -hmm. some chords, some seventh chords, you know, like um, A seven, D seven, and E seven. Um, get a feel for it. You want to um, have an understanding of the feel for the for the music. So, I always reckon you go, go back and listen to some of the masters. You know, so so any of the any of the kings is a good good start there, or Tim Bone Walker. You know, and um, and, and take it from there. There's the method I use, I'll, I'll go through, um, if you look, talking about playing soloing in the blues, um, I'll use, go from a pentatonic scale out. I, I do, I've got a three-stage sort of thing that I use. Um, then we go through learning pentatonic, basic pentatonic scales. Then we'll learn what the blue notes are within those scales. And yeah. then some, then some colour notes to colour that. You know, to, to give you pretty much all the, 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 the sounds that you'll get in most of the basic sort of blues sort of stuff. Um, if you're into finger picking, it's another thing. You know, like acoustic blues is another thing altogether. You know? but, I, but I do a bit of that too. And um, with that sort of stuff, we go into steady bass, alternating bass stuff. You know, go right back to uh, Mississippi, John Hurt and um, Blind Blake and um, th those sort of players. You know, moving through Bill Brunsey and that sort of thing, which is always a bit of fun as well. But, uh, you got a first uh, blues name like Stormy or or Smoking or anything like that, Ross? No, no, I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, me either. We, got, we're not old enough for that. Are you? Not no, yet, anyway. Not yet. Give us a few more years. Well, you're definitely uh, not. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm getting there now myself, actually. Have you given one to Brian yet? Sorry? Have you given one to Brian yet? No, oh well, no, not yet. But he, yeah, I guess he's nearly sixty now, so he's getting Great. close to the, getting the name as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, does your book have video attachments as well? Yeah, yeah. I've got there's a, there is some video links um, to each of the chapters as well to try and explain on on the guitar a little bit more as what what's happening. So you, you can read it, then then um, link link into the video, and it'll show you. Um, I'll be explaining some of those things to directly to the guitar and hopefully that helps make a bit more sense because some people are a bit more visual learners. So that, that's the idea there anyway. Yeah, I, I know I'm like that. I, I need to see and hear something to make it. Oh, not always, but a lot, it makes learning a whole lot easier than just having something on paper. And I got a question from Ahmad Kareem here, who's a regular on the channel. He says, um, what would be the best way to start learning music theory? I did buy a guitar theory for dummies book and it has been helpful. Am I on the right track? So basically what I think Ross's book does, it takes all the practical stuff and, as well as the theory that you need to learn to get into this sort of, in, get into playing music and understanding some theory. So his book, you know, for seven bucks might be worthwhile checking out if, uh, if the one that you've got isn't helping. But I, I honestly think you can get value out of just about anything, whether it's another book or, or videos or all that kind of stuff as well. So Ross has been teaching 30 years for those who have just joined. He's not like he's only been doing it three or six months, like, you know, some guitar, te guitar teachers out there. So I've known him for probably 20 years and he's always stood out when he played live um, just because of the way he plays and his understanding of music has always been a lot higher than just about any of my friends. He actually understands what's going on. And um, we've got another question from uh, Alp Ozcan. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He says, uh, what do you think about visual and pattern approaches like the cage system? Do you think memorization of shapes hurts the ear-based playing? I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I, I kind of, I, I think I might get where he's coming from. Look, I, I didn't, I use cage. Um, to, to teach now, um, 
I, I think it's a good way to, it's like, um, I, I liken it to like a, a GPS for guitar. It helps you get your way around the neck. But it's not about just sticking in that. Um, I, I think that um, what I find when I play is whilst I've done the exercise on the scale exercise, I do, you know, I, I see things or see chord shapes in a caged way and scales around those. These days I, I tend to work in an area and I just start playing. But that doesn't, um, I don't actually think about what I'm doing. I mean, if, you, if I stopped, I could tell you what was happening. I can tell you what notes they were and, um, you know, yeah. what the, the scale degrees. If I'm playing the flat seven there against this, that, or that, or I might be playing chromatically through here. But I don't think about that anymore I'm playing. So I think sometimes, you know, people get too hung up in being on this side or that side of the thing as far as the concept goes. You said caged and what, ear-based sort of thing. I think that they both actually link together quite well. Um, but you need to do the work to get to the stage where you don't have to think so much about what you're doing. So I would take an approach, whether it be caged or something else, and then work that approach. You've got to have a concept to start from. And if you've got that concept and the foundation, then you're okay to work from there. That, that's, that's the way I look at it anyway. So I've found cage is quite helpful. Um, I think originally it came from Joe Pass. And if you know Joe Pass is a great jazz guitar player, and I know that he did use that system, and it certainly didn't hurt Joe at all. Joe was just a magical player, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I know a lot of the country guys and that the Nashville guys use, um, well, they use a chord based visualization method, which is effectively caged anyway. They still use the, those basic shapes to work around, and yeah, you know, I find it a good way to approach they, they approach playing the guitar anyway. Cool. How about some of those um, hardcore jazz folks that just absolutely, like uh, one guy that comes to mind would be like Herb Ellis. <laughs> I, I don't know yeah. what he does on the guitar, but I, I like it a lot. He just flies around. I mean, not so much the speed's the, the impressive thing, but I guess uh, my question might be, where would his head be in terms of, if you, if you can answer that, I'm, I'm not too sure, but what would be the, the typical jazz player's approach? And is it very similar to sort of like the country guys as well? Yeah, I reckon the jazz guys and the country guys are quite similar in some ways. The country guys tend to work off the chords a lot more. But then, you know, like Joe Pass worked off chords quite a bit too, you know. Um, the, the, the only difference, I think, is that some of the rock guys are the guys that have come in purely on pentatonic because they're, they're used to just playing. And I, I was one of these guys as well. You're just used to playing um, one scale, scale fits all. Yeah. And... Um, so it's actually hard to move from that because you're just used to blowing away on a scale. Let's get a pro progression. Let's hit that you know, box pentatonic scale. Off we go. Mm -hmm. But then after a while, you realise that that's just not not good enough. You know, well, it is if that's all you want to do. But, but if yeah. you improve your playing, um, so I would um, yeah. So you asked about like people like Herb Ellis. So I don't know about Herb particularly, but but I do know with Joe because I've got some of his. Um, his workshops, I mean, my old teacher here in Melbourne, Bruce Clark, used to have some of these guys around uh, in, in his, his um, living room. They'd be doing a, a workshop. So, you know, somewhere in Mol down in Malvern there, you know, in the lounge room, you'd have Joe Pass with 20 guys, you know, giving a clinic, which was <laughs> yeah. some, which is pretty amazing. So I've got some tapes of some of that stuff. And, and, yeah, wow, cool. Yeah, and, and Barney Kessel, you know, all those sort of great oh, players. And, yeah, yeah, man. That's yep. one of my favourite clips on YouTube, actually, is Barney Kessel and Herb Ellis just yeah. playing ways to some song, man. It's awesome. They're just... Oh, yeah. They're, they're some unbelievable. Great song. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah. I can highly recommend anyone watching this, go check out that video. Just type in, uh, after, you know, Barney Kessel and uh, Herb Ellis. Ellis live. And there's a clip of them, I guess, from the 70s, judging by the... the what they're wearing. And yeah, the, 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 the coats and stuff. They, oh, they, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's off the planet. Yeah, but you know, like her, but what they don't realize is that Barney Kessel worked, he did a lot of work with Elvis. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. He worked in the studios and and also um, on T Bones, one of T Bones al albums, he was their second guitar player, T Bone Walkers. Oh wow, yeah, T Bones one of my favorite players. He's a great mix of like uh, sort of jazz infused blues, I guess. It's yeah. that middle ground. It's right in the middle of both, and he sounds. <laughs> Even today, he holds up. It's just brilliant. I mean, other than his amazing vocal, which, which is one of the best yeah. blues vocals, I reckon, of all time, because he's not really a screamer, but he's got such a great tone in his vocal. 
And he's just his lines. It's just it's really hard stuff to kind of nail too if you're trying to pinch his licks. It sounds easy, and then you go to play it, you go, hang on a second, this isn't straight, this isn't straight blues. <laughs> <laughs> No, he is what they call the colour tones before. There's a lot of the colour tones in T-Bones. He's playing off the sixths a lot and ninths and um, yeah. you know, thirds and stuff like that. So, yeah, he, I mean, he, he grew up with Charlie Christian, who's the great electric jazz guitar player as well. Who, so between the two of those guys, they set the foundation for a lot of music. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Well, let's listen to a Chuck Berry album we're hearing T-Bone lines everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you could be right about that, actually. I might not have noticed that. Well, listen to Johnny Be Good, then go back to T Bone Walker, and you'll hear the whole, you know, the, pretty much the solo of Johnny Be Good is all T Bone Walker lines. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know uh, even Hendrix took a lot out of, uh, and Buddy Guy took a lot out of uh, uh, T Bone in one way or another, whether it's yeah. um, very different sounds, obviously, but you can, they got a lot of inspiration from T Bone, even the way he played with his guitar out from his body and yeah. well, he did a lot of crazy stuff. Him in his head as well, yeah. So I think Jimmy got a lot from him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I got a question here from Ryan P. He says, um, I've never heard of this, so maybe, maybe you have. It says, could you ex please explain what voice leading is and how do you choose what chord extension to use maybe? I think yeah. that's what I'm supposed to say. Yeah, yeah. Voice, voice leading is how you move. Basically, it's a, a big term for moving from one chord to another. And, and so each note in the chord is called a voice. So how you move from one voice in the chord to the next voice in the next chord, um, yeah, it's in some sort of types of music, it's um, it's it, it's um, it's more prevalent, I guess, in, in jazz. You know, where you're voice leading chords in in harmony, and harmony vocals, you're voice leading as well. That's hence the term voice leading. Um, I think um, it's good to know, and I think. I don't think what I do initially with people when I teach people triads, basic three note chords, is we do voice leading there so that they get to hear how a different inversion with an inversions, um, just a different order of the notes of a particular chord links with the next chord. So I might have uh, a situation where we've got um, a common tone in one of the chords to the next chords, or that the chord might only move. Um, the, uh, one or two frets max, you know, so they're, they're staying pretty closely with each other. Um, when you get to extensions or tensions, you know, that's when you're starting to talk ninths and elevenths and thirteenths. Um, the tensions that you add onto the chord will go. You know, um, th that's a different sort of story again, but or not not a different story, but the same sort of thing. You're looking at moving, um, moving those things um, to, to try and create something that doesn't jar. You know, so the effect of the movement of the chords nice and smooth. Sometimes you want that jarring movement, you know, for the type of style or something or an effect you're trying to make. But yep. generally, your voice leading. So even though you, you don't know what the term is, Shane, I, I know that you use voice leading when you're playing your, your rhythm work. You know, you yeah, cool. part of what you're doing <laughs> when you're creating smooth movement between chords. So oh, okay, yeah, it's a matter of knowing. Look, the more chord voicings you know, or a chord system you know, um, helps a lot too. That, that's what I was talking before about, you know, if you had, um, you know, when you, you, you know chords and how chords are built, if you understand the idea of inversions of those chords and understand what happens when you move one chord, one note in the chord to another note or move one, you know, you can make a dominant chord to a minor chord, etc. you know, by just moving a note within the chord. But you've got to understand that to do it. You can do it by ear to a limited degree, but by understanding the theory helps a lot. So, I'm pretty sure you covered some of that in your videos and books. I could be. I uh, did, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. So we've had uh, quite a number of people join. Um, so maybe let the folks know where they can find out a little bit more about you as well, or I can bring it up on, on screen here if you like. What, what yeah, if, if you can do that, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. So I'll, let me let me grab this. Sorry, it's a little fiddly. This uh, Google Plus Hangout sometimes. Yeah. Also got a, um, a Facebook page too, Ross Helmut Guitar Lessons. If anyone's interested as well, you can check out some things there. Cool, cool. If you pull that back down, it'll come down to the main page, I think. Oh yeah. So this is yeah. Ross's website here, and although he is based in Melbourne, Australia, you can order the book from anywhere in the world. And yeah, he's worked for a long, long time getting this done. And you know, I've got a copy of it, which I need to go through in more detail. But I actually helped film some of the videos 
in the in the content. So you can rest assured that the video quality is going to be great as well. Yeah. Blow my own trumpet, but uh, yeah, this we had a couple of times, there, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, we had a few goes. We're lucky we did it when I when we did because I've got six months of construction next door, which totally sucks. Totally and, sucks. Uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, $7.55, folks. So, um, yeah. And just to let everyone know, I'm not getting any kickbacks from this. I'm doing this because uh, Ross is a good mate of mine. And, yeah, he's written something that will help people understand a lot of theory in, a, in an easy-to-follow way with videos. So if you're like me and you want to sort of take your knowledge to the next place and learn something that, may, you know, learn something new that will actually help you progress then definitely check it out and just to let people know it's just it's basic stuff there the basic sort of stuff you need it's not going to like the question the guy asked before about um voice lead it's not going to go into in depth about that but mm -hmm. at least you'll understand that the concept exists you know and yeah. then, you can, then you can choose to pursue that if you want or not you know? and that, that's the idea of it it's to give you basics and if you want to pursue anything further of course you can from there at least you've got to know what 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 exists first. And is this limited to limited to a specific type of music, or is it theory that can be applied to a lot of different stuff? I guess is it. Well, the theory applies to anything or any modern music. I mean, and in classical music too. But generally, they're a little bit more formal the way they approach theory, and um, you know, they they get involved in the note reading and understanding terms of you know and, uh, of, of reading and sight reading and stuff like that. This is not about that. You don't need to read a note of music to understand this stuff it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, i mean I, I read music i teach reading music to people who need it uh, but i don't recommend it for everybody either you know? and that's uh that's all in tab yeah <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> so for those who yeah, missed right. podcast a long time ago um we did a, a topic called why tab is evil and it got a lot of mixed re mixed responses but mostly agreeing to some point but um yeah the thing with tab is you never can tell what you're going to get if it's come from just some dude at his house with a bad ear. So <laughs> just remember that. We got um, Jeff Anderson says, uh, lovely website, Ross. Nice cream Les Paul you were pictured with there. So, yeah. It's a nice yeah, guitar. It's, it's my old guitar, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I only read those things now that I'd forgotten um, about what we've done with the, the tab thing. And, um, <laughs> I only was looking through it the other night and said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I should have looked at some of these things earlier. But, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the point with it is, um, and look, even the point with learning stuff from people, I think I made this the point last time that you know, people get things wrong. Well, um, recently I was listening to a really interesting interview with um, oh, the bass player from the Meters. Um, what's the guy's name? Um, oh, uh, it wasn't Doc, Doc Dunn, was it? No, no, no. He, he's um, the bass he guy. Uh, any the meetings, um, you know, with Leo Nocentelli and, and uh, those guys. Um, I'm thinking of um, Booker T. Sorry, I'm thinking of Booker T. And the George MG, Porter so. Jr. George Porter Jr. Yeah, and, and George, you know, everyone does sissy strut. Mm -hmm. well, I know you do it, and the people do it. <laughs> no, I used to. Yeah, it, yeah. And, and George Porter Jr. goes, everybody gets it wrong. Yeah, I thought this is interesting. So I listened, to, and um, the guy that was taken uh, was doing the interview was. Um, he was playing it and George, no, you've got it wrong. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah. And it's just what happens is if you listen to that song, it's very easy to get wrong because you hear stuff that's not there. You think it's going to do something and it actually doesn't do it. It's actually a lot thinner. Or there's not as many notes. And so if you go back, if you can find the interview, it's really fascinating. But And, and um, then I thought, oh, well, I'm going to go and check out a few people and see on the, on the internet and see what's on. And the thing I could find was John Mayer. Yeah, with um. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. His version's pretty cool. The trio. Yeah, well, he's got it wrong though. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of those songs that, like, I, I know with myself, I don't go off and go out. I, I like to approximate a song and then just play it the way that works with the band yeah. because I, I don't have uh, George Porter Jr. playing with us and and guys of that caliber. So we 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 make do with whatever. What are we gonna do? Yeah. 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 The thing with right. it was. Right. Yeah. About that. I'm, I'm sure there's a whole lot less going on. It's like when I see other guys cover James Brown. There's a whole lot less going on rhythmic-wise than you think in some songs, obviously. And I say rhythmic as in guitar rhythmic. Yeah, It's got its own little window of space, you know, and a lot of guys will overcompensate on guitar. And, uh, yeah, I guess it's how you got to almost approach it with, you know, emulating something in mind and 
But uh, yeah, I might have to have another listen to the original because it's been a while since. Yeah, I've heard. Listen to it. It's it's just in the in the head of the tune, you know, in the melody. When it goes da ba da da ba ba, a lot of people play ba ba da 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 da, but it's actually yeah, yeah, da, yeah. da 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 da. There's oh, okay, cool, cool. Yeah. So it's actually a lot simpler. But you listen, and um, there's the other, I can't remember who who was it was the guy um that does live from Daryl's house was doing the interview, and he, he used to play in the Devil Brothers. And he just said, oh, you know, I probably got that wrong because I've been hanging in New, New York too long with the Jazz Cats, you know, and so that's, uh, they, they all overplay everything. So yeah, yeah, more notes yeah. you put in, they'll put in. You know? Just but a the, little off topic here. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, the, the point I was going to make with those, yeah, with tabs and stuff, it's not only the guy in in um, in, uh, in the garage or whatever, <laughs> he's got no idea or no ear that gets things wrong. It's also the guys with great ears that get things wrong as well. So I think you're better off getting it wrong yourself. If you're going to get it wrong, you might as well do it yourself. Yeah, and then you've got those tabs I've noticed of like live gigs where, you know, there's, you know, Eric Clapton's Unplugged is one that I, I used to have the book for that. Yeah. And there's times where, and it's very, very rare, but there's a, a couple of occasions where he actually hits a, a, like a note that you wouldn't want to go for in one of his big solos. It sounds yeah, fine. You wouldn't notice it. And I think it's tabbed that way as well. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, so that's a weird note. So, uh, yeah, it's sort of almost given you, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing to have it exact sometimes too, depending on where it, where well, it might be taken from. So sometimes I'll work out different versions of things. So if I'm teaching somebody a song, which I'll do, you know, um, a good examples on that album is one of the the, um, the big Bill Brunsy thing. What is it called? Um, hey, Hey. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is a great song. But Clapton plays it doesn't play it the same way as Brunsy either. He plays a different chord and... Um, so I sort of learned both ways of playing it, but I actually prefer Brunsy's, you know, by yeah. fair ways, actually. But but it's interesting to listen to how how's he's approached that or how he's learnt that. So, okay, mm -hmm. that's interesting. One thing I really love about um, the Clapton Unplugged session is he had like four or five songs that he knew he was going to do and the rest of it is completely winged. <laughs> yeah, okay. I thought that was pretty cool. Like Old Love, when that started, the bass player's like, you know, looking at him like, <laughs> what the hell's going on here? So, yeah, a lot of that session was was pretty much on the fly, which which is pretty pretty cool too. Yeah. Um, I've got a question. Actually, we've got uh, Bray Bart says, uh, "I love your content, Shane. Keep it up. Thanks, man. Appreciate that." And Jeff asks, um, "Do you teach solo jazz style, um, path pass Kessel style?" It, when it meant solo, like chord melody style, is, is that? What um, yeah, I guess he just means maybe like well, improvisational style. Way. I'm not I'm not 100 percent certain if he means on his own or or yeah yeah yeah. I do teach it to a degree. You know, um, I, it's I, I do teach people basic improvisation and, and getting into that sort of thing, and also as to how to put chord melody together. If they're getting right into some of um, Joe's finger style chord melody, I don't really do that. Um, it's one of the things I like to get into a little bit more, but you know, times time is, you know, time is of the essence, as they say. So, but I yeah. certainly can teach you the basic concepts of how that works, you know, and um, and how to put the chords together, the chord melody for solo guitar, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. All right, cool. We've got one more question here, if you don't mind. We've got uh, Zach asks, uh, "What is the best way to move into modes?" I understand the basic premise. But what's the best way to apply the understanding? Is mode something? I think. I mean, your book's more aimed at. Yeah, we don't we don't approach modes in the book, but okay. um, but I, I thought this comment this would come up at some stage because it always does, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's like the yeah. question asked the guru. <laughs> yeah, I always ask about modes. Well, modes. Well, you know, modes is just another name for scale. So it, it's really, um, and it's a, a matter. Of, it's how you use chord scales. Um, so. I think that the modes in, in modern music sort of started coming in, well, first time was probably with Miles Davis in the kind of Blue album, um, was when it was put, probably put on, on the map a little bit. And then through the 60s, it started with some of the guitar players and, and some of the jazz courses as well. But it was probably more just a way of explaining how, how to plug that scale against that chord or whatever. And, and for, for me, modes... Um, you know, you have like your parent scale, say the major scale, and it's got its modes. 
I, I don't think of things as, as modes as such. I think about the chord more and it, it effectively becomes the mode. I, I hope that, that makes some sort of sense. Um, yeah, a bit like how uh, Knopfler would approach the guitar where he plays... Oh, he's like, a very say, much a chord bass player, yeah. A, a D minor chord, you know, via the fifth fret and he'll play a lot of the notes sort of within the chord. Is that is that what you're sort of getting at? Uh, yeah, but I'll, if, I, if I'm playing, if I'm sort of... Let's say if I'm playing the key of C and I'm playing a D minor or a D minor thing, mm -hmm. I'll think of the chord tones there and I'll put the notes around. Remember before I said you know, I'll just play and I'll just all notes will come through. If someone analysed that, they'd probably say it was D Dorian. Okay, yep. but I don't tend to think of it that way, and I think a lot of players don't. Um, they tend to, it, yeah. It, the mode can get the modes themselves can get very confusing for people, and they shouldn't be. You know, in in this situation of someone say like Satriani and Vi, that's a different sort of thing. They tend to play, um, they'll tend to play off a modal type of thing where they'll they'll focus on a mode as such. And I'm not sort of that into, I'm not into their style that much to understand that. I, I could understand it if I if I spent some time with it, just looking at it, and I understand the basic premise of what they're doing. They'll move through modes, and um, yeah, there was a comp, there was a particular term they used for it. I can't remember what it was, but. Um, it was basically hitting on sort of a pedal sort of tone or a pedal sort of chordal sound and playing modes you know, pretty quickly across that sort of thing, then moving through or moving around that sort of area. Um, but in general playing, um, you, know, you talked about Knopfler before, I mean, Dave Gilmore is another one who, those, those guys, you know, they're very melodic because they're, they're pretty aware of what's happening with it, what chords are moving around them, and that's how they're playing through it. They're not just blowing a scale against something. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you wanted to understand modes, I think the best way to understand modes is just understand the chord and just how, understand how the scale tones work around that chord. And that, that's effectively all a mode, a mode is in the, the ten sense that they're talking about. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. I hope and, that uh, helps. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. I'm, I'm sure that, that will... A lot of people are saying thanks for the explanation as well. I haven't shared that with you. But, uh, yeah, there's been plenty of thanks for uh, answering the question. Um. All right, so uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to lay some on us. I am monitoring the chat here. And like I said before, if you want to check out Ross's stuff, I've put all the links to his website and so forth in the description of this video. This video will also be archived on the In The Blues channel. So if you missed the start and you want to go back and watch it from the start and take it all in, you're more than welcome to. But yeah, well, I'm more than happy to pass some questions on to Ross. He can't see the the chat right now, so I'm keeping an eye on it for him. So feel free to. Yes, ask I, was, away. I decided I was technic was technologically challenged. If I was watching that as well, I wouldn't be able to handle it. <laughs> so I left it in your hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. I think uh, this. Oops, sorry. Am I muted? Oh no, no. Okay, it's okay. Cool, yeah. Um, I thought I, I hit something and a pop-up came up. I'm not sure what that was. So uh, so Zach says, yeah, that's a great way to think. I guess I look way closer to the theory behind the chords and work from that. Um, Alp says, have you experimented with regular tunings like fourth or major thirds? And if you did, what do you think in relation to standard tuning? If you need me to ask you that again, let me know. I wasn't too probably clear yeah yeah I'm, I'm not sure but bas basically I, I i'm pretty much a standard tuning guy yep um yeah, there's plenty in there to find and i um, I, I won't get through it all in a lifetime so i i've, I've played a little bit around with things like dad gad and those sort of tunings but um um yeah it's yeah I, um so if he's talking about force he's talking about like the strings tuned in you know, the, the tuning of the guitar and standard tuning or maybe, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Maybe yeah, maybe the like third on the second string sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, cool. I got two main tunings I use in and out. Yeah, I've been pretty good at out sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. So yeah, Ross's book will uh, be a valuable addition to some knowledge if you're into it. Go check it out. It's on Amazon, and I've put links to Ross's website in the description. So feel free to check it out. Is there anything else you'd you'd like to discuss about your book or fill people in on what's in there? If if we yeah, um, I think no, I think we've pretty much covered most of that now, Shane. If anyone's got any questions, the questions are always great. They kind of drive things a bit. You know, um, I, I, yeah, I'm always happy to answer questions, and um, 
know, the questions are good questions, like the question about the modes and things like that, because you know people always want to always ask about it. You know, people yeah. get confused by that sort of stuff. You know. What are some other questions you'd get on a sort of like a regular basis from students? Is there anything that people come to you and they go, "Look, I need to work this or that out in particular"? And yeah, I, I think um, I think one of the things you know, you, um, you talked about the four chord song before, and um, what, what's that um, clip on YouTube with the four chord song, the comedy thing? That um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll uh, I'll dig it up. It's uh, dig it up. It's worth everybody having a look at because th then you start to get what I'm talking about. How, how so many songs are quite similar. I mean, it's not that simple because you know they're, they're just fragments or big big fragments of the songs. But you know they they do. Um, um, there, there's so many songs like that. I mean, I, I did probably about two or three years ago. I did this weird sort of show um, called Bandioki. Right? Yeah. It, um, a guy I work with, Steph, asked me to go and do this bandioki. We did a couple of weeks of this out at um, a hotel in Springvale. It was really quite funny. I think my friend Jeff does this. Go ahead, yeah. yeah. So anyway, what you do is um, it's like a karaoke thing, but I'm a guitar player playing along with the karaoke. Well, to be honest, I'm not really up with all the latest music because it's a lot of it I don't really like. I've heard it all before kind of thing. So, so anyway, we're doing this stuff. And, and Steph sort of said after, he said, oh, you, did you know those songs? I said, no, I had, hadn't heard half of them before. I said, how did you play them? <laughs> I said, well, they're all, all the same. I knew it was going to happen next. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got that um, I've got that clip. So what I'll do, I'll just skip over to show people what to look for if uh, if they want to check it out. So Axis of Awesome is what it's called, and it's a four chord song. And you'll be surprised. Go some five minutes, and the song... Uh, here you go. The top comment is uh, this video will inevitably, inevitably force you to be happy. So that's cool. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really cool. And all the songs that you've heard over the years, like I mentioned earlier, you two and, and, and oh man, where, where to begin? There's just a Let it be song. down under. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A whole bunch of stuff, yeah. It comes down to the, the melody that's sitting on top of these songs, you know, that differentiates them a lot of the time. But uh, yeah, the. This video is really cool, and unfortunately, I won't be able to play it and have it sound any good the way we're we're doing this. So, but yeah, definitely check out this Axis of Awesome. It's had forty million views. I think a few of those were mine. <laughs> yeah, a few of them were mine too. Yeah, it, it's really cool. It's really cool. Just a little bit off topic with with music here. What are some folks that you um, that you're into that you think? You know, other people might be interested in checking out. It doesn't really matter what what genre. Just feel free to shoot some names out there in terms of you know cool yeah. music that people can check out. It's always a hard question. I, I like um, um, you know, I like a lot of old country stuff these days. You know, um, what what you might call alternate country or stuff. Um, people have been around a long time. They're sort of in in this that sort of scene. Like you know, we went and saw Rodney Crowell last year. He was just you know fabulous, great songwriter and. Uh, a terrific performer, a really warm performer. I've seen him twice now, you know. Lyle Lovett's another one, you know, in that sort of sort of space, in that country-ish sort of space, gospel space, who's just, um, he's a magical performer. He he's obviously likes people, you can see. I uh, know I get him on my Facebook feed, you know, he's got pictures and um, when he takes a picture of someone, he always says, oh, you know, he might have a picture of Shane. He said, I'd like to thank Shane for allowing me to take a picture of him, you know, sort of thing, you know. He's, he's that sort of a guy, you know, he's just... That, that sort of, and so I like songs. I really like songs, and um, um, more than you know, as a guitar player, I, I, I mean, I like guitar players, and I love listening to guitar players and what they do. But I like it in the context of a song. So, yeah, you know, for, for me, there's some players that are great players, but when I, I've seen them play their solo shows live, and really, I like to go home after about 10, 15 minutes because. <laughs> It just gets a bit boring, you know, but when they're in the concert, when they're playing with some of the bands and the music they play, they're just fantastic. And I like to see them in that context. Yeah, I agree. I, over the year, like over the last few years, especially, my sort of like I still love listening to great guitar, but I like it more in context to song and, and in great vocals, all that kind of stuff. And like one guy I can think of off the top of my head that I've been listening to death the last, I don't know, a couple of months is Jerry Reed, you know, like oh, Jerry Reed's fabulous, yeah. Fantastic guitar player, not necessarily like in your face. Um, you know, he's, he's, he plays a nylon string guitar on the most part. There's a few clips of him on YouTube playing electric guitar, but he plays with Chet Atkins and, or he used to, and a whole lot of guys. Um, he passed away a few years back, and I don't know how long ago now, actually, but yeah, it would be, would be a few years ago. But 
Yeah. I love listening to great guitar in context of songs. Uh, that, that's uh, Jerry that's Reed's songs are fantastic. I mean, some of the instrumentals awesome. just go, what was he doing? Now, I mean, I, I teach a couple of those. I've, I've learned. <laughs> I've spent you know, like months learning some of those songs. You know, and, yeah, and um, you know, I think it was Tommy Emmanuel told the story about, about about him, or someone told the story about him. Someone asked him to play blue. There's one of his songs called Blue Finger. I think yeah. it was Blue Finger anyway. And they said, um, you know, um, Jerry played play Blue Finger, and he goes, "What's that? It's <laughs> one of yours, one of your songs." He goes, "I don't know that song." <laughs> it turned out what what it was. Is that whenever he used to go into Chet Atkins' office at RCA, he would he'd be playing guitar, and Chet used to always run a tape. He just used to tape everything Jerry did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he actually put it together, called it Blue Finger, and credited it to Jerry Reed. So everyone thought Jerry wrote the song. Well, he did. It was all his ideas, but Chet actually <laughs> pinched the ideas. He did credit. He said it's Jerry Reed, so written by Jerry Reed, but Jerry never played it before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a great. There's also a great video of those two guys. Um, I think. Uh, Chet Atkins says we're going to do uh, whatever the name of the song is, and and you can see like he's not. Jerry Reed's kind of like what what are we playing? He goes, I'll start it, so it's so it's done right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he says it jokingly, like you know, yeah. taking t- taking the piss out of him. But uh, yeah, yeah, I've, he's a great entertainer. I really dig his sort of positive vibe and and just just his songs, man, and his voice is great. And yeah, if you you want to see some really cool uh, finger picking and stuff. Um, I really like this clip. It's cheesy as nobody's business. It's got to be from the, I guess, the 80s or maybe even early, earlier. It could be a 70s clip. I'll, I'll bring it up on, on screen here. This will, uh, you'll either like him or, or you won't when you hear this. So, uh, oh, yeah, God, look at this guy. Yeah, what, the Wabash Cannonball. It's, uh, yeah. it's, it's a great clip. I mean, talk about a great songwriter, great singer. And if you watch this guy's hands, man, like I, and he's singing over the top of this as well. It's insane. So uh, definitely, yeah. definitely check him out, folks. He's a, he's a gun. He does a weird thing with his right hand on on on, on, his, on his index finger. It's kind of funny to watch. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just pick up and just have a look at it. So I'm not not quite sure what he's doing sometimes. But um, I learned to play the claw. You know the claw. That, that's um, one of his classics. And um, there's there's actually a clip on YouTube of him. Sort of showing you a bit, but you really like a lot of those things when people show you, you don't really pick up much. But yeah, yeah, when I'm working stuff out like that, I'll go to that, I'll find other clips of playing live, and I'll listen to chat and I'll listen to everything and try to pick up whatever I can to, to get the song together because yeah. you need every help you can get to pick up some of that stuff. I've been meaning to do Strutton for a while, Tommy does a great version of that, and um, I keep starting it, but it scares me, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It shows your uh, mortality on the guitar when you start yeah. up songs from Tommy Emmanuel. That's uh, that would be a, yeah, yeah, his stuff is sort of like the next level of of Chet in some ways, I suppose. Hey, he's basically playing the bass yeah. line over the top of a lot of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, he's sort of taking Chet and Jerry stuff and just taking it another, another level now. He's just fantastic, you know, that stuff. Yeah, yeah, cool. But it's it's easily interesting to hear when he um he he put me back. I mean, I listened to something he was talking about. Um, Doing a Jerry, he was doing. They do a Jerry Reed show every year now. I think in Nashville, like a tribute. Yeah, and it's a whole bunch of guitar players to get together. And Tom was talking about how he, when he was in the airport, wherever he is, he's just practicing this one song to get it together for that show, mm-hmm. which was um, Mr. Lucky. I think it was Mr. Lucky a couple of years ago. He did, and you can't find any stuff. It's hardly hard to find Mr. Lucky anywhere. But I remember I, I used to know it way back. So it's one that I'm. I've got back up and running again now, but even Tom said he had to practice hours and hours and hours a day just to get it right for performance level. So, and you know, haven't known Tom way back and know the amount of work he puts in. You know, people think that he's just a natural. Well, yeah, he is, but he does a hell of a lot of work to get there. You know, and um, yeah, and I know Mr. Lucky now. If if, if Joe, um, one of the guys I teach, is um, watching this tonight or at some stage we're, we're going through that at the moment and he's having the ball with it but it is hard it's a hard tune i think that's what people misunderstand about guitar in general like a lot of people go oh you're more naturally inclined to play music than i am or or i've heard that from other players and i'm like i'm not i mean i was just as bad as everyone else when i first started there's i think in motor skills and speed some people are naturally maybe more um have more dexterity in their fingers but it can also be taught. It's not something like playing fast hasn't been something that 
you know, I've pursued as much as like filling my head with blues licks, for example. Yeah. So it, it, it's that 10, they always say 10,000 hours, you put 10,000 hours into anything, you're gonna be one of the best around in whatever it is that you do. If you're putting 10,000 hours into knowledge in, in business or 10,000 hours into guitar or bass or drums, you're gonna to get to a point where you're gonna learn. But I think there is some sort of, um, maybe maybe a, the part of the brain that connects the dots, there might be some people that can connect dots uh, a lot quicker than others. And there's, I think that also comes through pursuing some sort of theory rather than just relying on your ear a lot as well. Yeah, it can just short circuit things a bit. I mean, I remember you when you first started hanging around some of the blues jams that when you were a young guy, you know, way, way back. And the thing, if anyone wants to know why Shane is where he is and what he's doing today, is he just had this enormous thirst for knowledge. And Shane would go, well, how did you do that? What happens there? How does this work? You know, he'd just be yeah. asking all the time, you know, and he'd be like, still doing that with guys now, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you too, yeah. You're like another mate of mine, Rod. He just wants to know everything. But it, it's, why, it's how you get to know stuff. You, 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 um, you had a thirst for the knowledge and you, you got it. And, and, and even with what you're doing now, you, you're quite inspirational in what you do because, you know, you've just gone out and done stuff. You don't think about it as much. You I mean, sure, you think about what you're doing, but you just yeah. go and do things, like put the band together, start writing songs, do the album and that. I think it's terrific. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that I, I, I've always... Well, not, maybe not always, but I've learned over the years that I was my own worst enemy. I was holding myself back in a lot of areas of life, like whether it's playing guitar or even now, like like I said to you earlier on the phone, guitar playing, still I, I still practice every day. I still noodle around and also practice productively. But, you know, I'm now finally working on my vocal. Like that's the one thing that I've always felt like I need to get this better. Um, but... You know, I was never an audio engineer, but I've learned how to do that over the last 10 years. It's something that I've always wanted to learn for myself and, and you know, even editing videos, all that sort of stuff, doing the YouTube thing and, you know, trying new things in life is is usually ends up with a better result if you give it a go. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, that's one. Thanks, man. I appreciate the, the nice words. And, uh, yeah, I'm just stubborn enough to want to try to get things to where I'm happy with them and, and a lot. You know, if I learn a new a new lick or, or whatever it is, and I am, I struggle just as badly as anyone else. And I remember, I think it was a Tommy Emmanuel video. He said, "If you learn something new, play it for play it for four days straight. <laughs> play it for five days straight. Get it under your fingers so you don't even have to think about it." And that's the best way to for me to learn too. I think a lot of guys might. Oh, that's just sort of off topic where we started, but I, it, it's a lot of guys might try to learn too much too soon. So yeah. I think what what's pretty cool about you know what you've done with your book is you've sort of taken taken some of the mystery out of some of this stuff and it will work for you know anyone that might be wanting to get out of that rut of knowledge. So yeah, you've yeah, for you've guys is, even for songwriters, you know, it's um you know one of the guys I teach. He, he's um you know he, he writes quite a lot, you know, and so we've talked about you know. Keys, so he doesn't even know what keys songs were in. So we, we played a whole bunch of them and, and I got him to work it out. And he found out he had a whole heap of songs in the key of G. He said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might have to change some of those. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Just, just getting that knowledge. And, and then, you know, I said to him, You know, the other thing is that, you know, to, as a songwriter, go and listen to um, a lot of really well crafted songs and, and, and have a listen to what they're doing because now you've got a bit more knowledge, you can analyze what. It's happening with the chord progression now and yeah. if you can do that then you can sort of feel, okay now i can use that in in my songs not the same program well, well they are in in, in, in in the same progressions that we've talked before but there's actually there's something i'll talk about just for a second because it um i meant to mention it before when we we're talking about songs and the, the axis of awesome and uh, i think came up recently with um led zeppelin and um stairway to heaven and being taken to court you know and, yeah, oh, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. yeah, but if you listen to it, I can name about 10 or more songs that are used the same progression way before that band that ever thought they'd ramp the progression up anyway. You know, it, it's just a chord progression. The melody and stuff is what holds the song, you know. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, um, yeah, so the, 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 the judgment was right on that. That's it. One didn't rip them off of that song, but, but yeah. certainly the chord progression underneath it's a lot of other songs, yeah. 
Yeah, it would definitely be that, you know, the Axis of Awesome video that I was sharing with everybody before. For those who have just joined, check out Axis of Awesome Four Court Songs. If everyone uh, was sued in that video, <laughs> they'd all be yeah. suing each other, you know, like... There's about 19 or 20 songs in the world and that'd be it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Imagine yeah. if anyone sued someone for, for the 12-bar for the, um, the, the blues progression. <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's... I always wondered about that. Hang on, so sorry, Ross. Uh, LKJ asks, are we taking questions? Yeah, absolutely. Feel free to ask some questions. Please. Uh, I always wanted that with blues. You know, there's so many guys that just do that, you know, dun da 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 blues <laughs> over, you know, and, oh, it's an original song. It's like, well, well no, maybe, really. maybe lyrically it is, and we're all guilty of, you know, I'm a, I'm a sort of, I touch my, uh, you know, I go into the sort of touching the blues thing a little bit, with with a lot of my stuff as well i take those some of those grooves and mix them up a bit too but uh yeah there's so many original blue songs that go chunka 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 in g like <laughs> oh <laughs> well, we'll make it original we'll put it in an a <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 that's it that's it yeah no it's, it's well again it's like brunsy like um, was it key to the highway who wrote that uh yeah i think it was i think it was I think it's credited to Brunsy sometimes, but even he like then they say that that was borrowed from there and borrowed from there. And Brunsy said, "Yeah, but that's the way we did it. We just just borrow stuff from everybody, you know." Yeah. But so a lot of those old blues songs so that were written that way, you know. I always thought it was Big Bill Brunsy, but yeah, I think. All that's right, really so here we go. So blues uh, pianist Charlie Seeger, the Seeger, recorded yeah. the song in 1940. Jazz. Runes you followed in 1940, 1941. So they covered the song the same year. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Imagine you did that today. Like you get a number one hit and uh, just from copying the number one hit, that would be hilarious. Hey, uh, here's a question for you. Have you ever looked at modern country music as in not so much like the gun guitar stuff like Brad Paisley, but there's a lot of commercial yeah. country music. Have you ever heard the similarities between tunes? Yep. Yeah, yeah. All pretty, they're, they're a lot of them come from that four chord progression. Oh, sorry. Go, ahead. Go ahead. A lot of them come from that four chord song. Yeah, and there's a, there's a great acoustic video of these patterns or how to play like five popular country songs from last year and they're literally like very, very, very similar. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there's actually a, a mishmash uh, mix of all the number one hits of 2014 that are put together in one big, um, audio session in like whatever Pro Tools or whatever, and they hit play and they chop each of them up and they all fit. It's it's hilarious. Fantastic. <laughs> but that's that's the nature of the business, you know. When you get something that works, you just repeat it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, um, yeah. All right. So if you don't mind, we've got one more question here. Bray Bart asks, uh, "Don't know if this question has been asked before, but where would I start with theory?" Well, I could almost answer some of that. You could. Check out the links in the description. Take you through to Ross's website. <laughs> yeah. Start start there and, and then then take it from there. If you need to, don't do any further. There, there are some good, more extensive books out there, but they tend to be more in the jazz jazz realm, you know. Um, but there's some good um, songwriting books too that um, that that um, you know I might um, shoot the the um, titles to Shane at some stage. They're, they're worthwhile, but you've got to have just the basics and basic understanding first so if you get the basic understanding from my book then you can go on to other things and, and pursue whichever line you want from there you know but um yeah well, i actually learned theory originally from a guy called john reese who was the bass player in men at work oh wow cool before he was the bass player in men at work he, he i think he's a classical violinist actually but um and so but we did a lot of stuff like um four-part choral harmonies and all this sort of classical stuff you know um, doing the exercises was quite good, but it really doesn't bear any, um, it doesn't have any relevance to anything I do now or as, a, as a guitar player, but it was kind of a good exercise to do. Um, but for, for what I do now, what I've written is, is your basic starting point. And from there, you can, you can move on from there. Yeah. yeah That's okay. what, what I'd say. I've got, I guess, what might be, I don't know if it's off topic, but we we're talking about musicians and bands and stuff before. Um, I think this is your student. He asks, uh, are there any standout players in bands out there now that we should keep an eye on? So, I mean, that could go, you could go back as far as you like. And yeah. if there's anyone in particular, that, I mean, we, we did name quite a few guys before. So you yeah, welcome. I did name a few, but I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure of the guys playing now. Um, 
I don't know. You know, the one guy that I I want to I I put in that category is uh, Greg Cock, who's just yeah yeah yeah, yeah. phenomenal player. <laughs> he is yeah. He, I mean, he's one of those guys. Um, there's guys like him, and I'd put some of the country guys in that realm as well. Um, the, um, yeah. Guth, Guthrie Traps a beauty for country player. I've never seen Guthrie at all, but he's yeah, a yeah, yeah. ripper. Phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and what's his name? The other guy's been around a bit longer. Um, oh, God. The other guy that does all the sessions. There's another session. There's a, um, a guy called Tom Bukovic. Okay. You know, you know Tom Bukovic? He does a lot of the, the more rock sort of based session stuff in Nashville. And okay. He, he toured, toured with Keith Urban for a little while too, but pretty much anything that's got sort of a rock edge to it, he's he's the guy that does that. He's like... um. He's like the connoisseur of tone, you know. There's yeah, a couple. Yeah. Of, there's a couple of little clips up on on YouTube of him, but nothing really does. Well, there's a few that might. Yeah, they're worth having a look at anyway. But if you read about the guy, you go, oh, okay, that's pretty interesting. And he went through all that Zeppelin thing and everything. So, yeah, you know, he's got all the, the the proper guitars and the proper amps and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, you know, when I say yeah, proper, yeah. you know, if you want it, you know, the the um, Defender Tweed sort of amp, then he'll bring that in and yeah. You know, he, he'll get the sounds that they want, so he's 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 pretty interesting guy to have a look at. Just that, that people might not know. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree. Another guy that I, I can think of off the top of my head is Johnny Highland, who's a yeah. country guy, but he also plays blues extremely well. Like one of the best guitar solos I've ever heard is from uh, Johnny Highland playing a PRS outdoors at some festival, and it yeah. just. It makes you sick. It's so good. It really yeah. is so good. Yeah, he's, a, he's a hell of a player too. You know, he sits there picking away on that guitar, does a bloody good job of it. I'm Johnny Harlan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got a pretty that's, funny funny voice too. That's the guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah there would be plenty. You know, and you just you don't think, can't think of them when you, you know. I mean, there's the, they're the old timers like Jeff Beck and all those sort of guys, you know, who are pretty damn good. And, um. There's a guy, um, what was his name? He came out here with Rodney Crowell and Emmy Lou, who's an Australian guy. Um, and he's, he's a really nice player. Um, and I just, his name slips me at the moment. But, but uh, another friend of mine um, sure. saw him um, years ago. And he, he told me, he, he sent me a text on Facebook, Gary. He said, I, I saw these guys. Um, we were doing a country showcase at the Norwood Town Hall or somewhere in Adelaide, and he said they had a couple of young up and comers. One of them was Casey Chambers, and the other one was was um, oh, this this fellow. And his name slips me at the moment, but really good player, lovely, good country player. But I've seen him do other stuff too. You know, um, you know he's been living in America for quite a while, but he's just a country boy from South Australia. Yeah, yeah well, no, I'm not too sure. I'll have to look into that. I, yeah, I'm not too sure. But most of those Nashville session guys, man, they're they're just. They're just off the charts good, you know, like they're yeah. extremely musical. They, they understand what they're doing. There's no second guessing, which is kind of like where I, I'd eventually like to get to at some point in my guitar playing. Yeah. Uh, quest is to not – look with what I know, I'm pretty comfortable, but then there's all this stuff that I think I should try and then I'm not too sure what's what's going to – where it's going to go. So yeah. there's definitely like, you know, I'd be an idiot, idiot to say I, I'm done learning theory. There's just – no way. I like to apply stuff to something. Like I always fi find for me to learn something new, even if concepts, understanding or, or a scale, I like to try to put it into some sort of musical context rather than just just under try to, you know, this is the knowledge of it. Now let's mess with it a bit. I, what do you think of like taking something like a scale and turning it into something less, I don't know how to ask the question, maybe... I think Brian might have, uh, my friend Brian sort of mentioned a while back, a lot of people will teach you scales, but they won't teach you melodies or they won't teach you yeah. like music. Um, what's your thoughts on when to maybe get away from just playing like a scale up and down? Um, yeah, I, I think like the scales are okay for a technical exercise. Um, yeah. And do you need to do them? Well, yeah, that kind of helps to get you... Um, it helps to get your fingers moving, but you know, some guys don't do them, and they haven't. I, I don't think Tommy really plays scales, um, but he's played so much music, and, and uh, he, he, you know, that that's how it works for him. Um, in some, I, I get my hot and cold on it. If I'm learning or trying to remember some shapes or things or how to move things around, I'll work on that for a little while, but then I'll just apply it to the tune, and, and um, to it's much more valuable applying it musically in a tune rather than running a scale up and down. 
yeah, yeah. Have so many guys come to me and say, oh, but I just sound like I'm running a scale up and down. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah because you are, you know, <laughs> that's what, you, what you're doing. So, <laughs> excuse me. So now we're going to make it a bit more musical. So how do you do that? Well, how do you learn phrasing? How do you, if you want to learn phrasing um, or phrasing a particular style, go back and listen to the masters of that style. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. And then try to apply it that way. And I'm pretty sure Brian does that. I mean, I've never asked Brian about it, but but the way he plays, um, you can you can hear it in his playing. You hear 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 him, hear him quoting certain people in his playing. Yeah, uh, he does of, really well. Yeah, and he's one of the very few guys that I've played. I, actually, you're one of these guys as well who you don't sound the same night in and night out, like kind of like how I play. I've got stuff that I I pull from, but Brian's one of these dudes. And like I said yourself, I, I, I couldn't really name too many or sing too many of your go-to licks like you could with me, for example. Brian and yourself are in this other category. He, he sort of says he approaches it a bit like a jazz guy. Like he very rarely will do the same thing a second time in, in any given night, which is crazy. It's not just – I used to think he had this big bag full of stuff. Yeah. He's, got, he's got the understanding and the knowledge of where he is on the guitar at any given moment. And he says he likes the challenge of going to some point on the guitar and working his way back. <laughs> I'm like, that's such a great concept. I'd love to have the confidence just to go, all yeah. right, let's start here and get to here and just see what comes out. <laughs> yeah. I see when I've seen some of you put some good clips up recently and I watched and I go, yeah, I can see Brian. You can see him sort of thinking through that too. You know, he's just going, yeah. Yeah, okay, I see what he's doing here. But And it's really, really impressive actually. It's very good. Um, but yeah, the, the lick, the, actually bringing up the lick thing is kind of interesting because um, I, I think if you learn or you get the flavour of the lick, lick and the phrasing, then then you need to, that's where the knowledge comes in. You can then take that and then make some things your own out of that. Mm -hmm. And that that's what I would do with it. And so when a guy's come, he, he's played some scales. So let's go and listen, let's learn some of these licks, but now let's take that lick and what, what can we do with it? Let's, let's expand out on it. Let's move yeah. some other notes around. Let's change the rhythm. Um, but yet you get the basic idea of how, how to phrase the style. You know? Yeah. Um, uh, we learn to talk that way by listening. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's great also um, to expand your listening as well into different things because I was very, very narrow-minded when I first started playing music. I was like, when I knew what I wanted to play, that was it. I shut out everything else. And I was strict minor pentatonic for years. Yeah. Um, and then now I incorporate a mix of like major and minor pentatonic. This is the way I would look at it. Maybe some Aeolian scale stuff as well. But I don't, I kind of see major and minor as one scale, which is how yeah. I, someone, Dave, our mutual friend, Dave Oliveri, he uh, said, yeah, it's the same thing. Just, you got to stop thinking of it like one or the other or whatever. Yeah. I'm starting to see where he comes from. In, in certain um, situations, it is. You can just, you can literally, you know, if you know one scale, you know the other one. Um, yeah, yeah, it's the same thing, just different orientation. But yeah. I think with, with blues, and, and I think we've touched on this before, the, the way I approach it, if I'm playing like a basic blues thing, it, it, it blues is built on a, on pentaton, minor pentatonic scale. That's the melodies of blues come from that. The sound comes from the minor third. So so I, I look at it that as as that as my foundation. But then the color tones. So I don't think of it as two separate things of major and minor pentatonic. When I'm teaching somebody, I'll say, okay, here's the minor pentatonic. Now these are our blue notes: the flat three and the flat seven. And we can also add the flat five, you know, which a lot of people call that the blue note, but really the most important blue note to me is the flat three because mm -hmm. it's the sound of that flat three going to the third, to major third, that creates that rub and the sound of blues. You know, you're playing like a, a dominant chord, say an A7, yeah. got a C sharp in it, but we actually play on the C, which is rubbing against that C sharp. And sometimes we bend halfway up there, you know, and yeah, create all these yeah, little sounds. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so that's what creates that sound. And then on top of that, I'll add the color tones of, of the the um, the three, the six, and the nine. Mm -hmm. And they're the three extra notes which really come out of the major pentatonic scale. So rather than thinking of it being a major pentatonic scale and a blues scale overlaying each other, I just think of adding those extra notes because um, if you think of the two scales, some people then start playing two scales and it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. But if you think of the foundation being the the, uh, 
minor pentatonic in, in blues, this is just in blues, and then you add those extra notes in around that, then you get to what T-Bone Walker's got, basically. That's what T-Bone does. Ah, okay, cool, cool. Yeah. We, we had a question here. Um, someone asks, have you heard of Joe Robinson before? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know a lot about him. I, I know that he, he was won some talent contest here a few years ago. My mum used to love him, so she, she thought he was fantastic. Um, but I didn't see it because I was always teaching. So, but I've, <laughs> I've seen some clips of him, and look, he, he sort of followed the similar line to Tommy. Uh, and, oh, okay, wow, okay. Yeah. So he, he's, I think he's in the states. There's a few guys that have been like, I think he's. I'm not sure he's been a protege of Tommy's or not. But you know, yeah. Tommy, Tommy used to help a lot of young players, and um, yeah, he's, he's been he's good, good like that. He he, he was in the early days because I used to know him quite well then, and he was quite helpful to me. Yeah, um, but. I think these days, because he's touring so much and so busy, his management are trying to keep him. Because Tom will play with anyone; he'll just keep playing and playing and playing. Mm -hmm. And they said, "Tom, you've got to get some sleep, man. You know, you've got to look after <laughs> yourself." So, yeah. Yeah, just not. So, I, you know, Joe's. Uh, he's one of those sort of. It's a, it comes from the same sort of school, I think, as Tom and that. And you know, he plays a lot of the chat stuff, and and, and, I'll, and I'm sure he plays a bit of electric stuff too. You know. But yeah, I mean, I'm happy. Yeah, I, I have no. I've never heard of this guy before, and it looks like he's doing pretty well, judging by some of the thumbnails on YouTube. So yeah. he's got a um, smoking Joe, mate. So he's already got a. Um, <laughs> yeah, he got it before he was twenty. <laughs> he's playing with Robin Ford in one of these clips, and it looks like uh, yeah. maybe Tommy Castro too. I'm not too sure. I'm only looking at the thumbnails here, but uh, yeah, yeah, it looks like he's he's doing pretty well. So he's cool, some cool. good people there, isn't he? <laughs> Sorry, he's in with some good people there, then, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, um, another question here is, uh, does everybody, oh, I guess the question is, should everyone learn music theory? Yeah. 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 If, if they're really serious about playing the guitar, they should learn it. Yes. Yeah. Um, you don't have to know everything. You just, if you've got a basic understanding, it's really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yes, everybody should, not everybody does and you can tell. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, cool. So our viewership has just peaked right now. So I got to ask the question. I apologize for asking, but who is Shane's guest? Um, in the title of the video, I've put Ross's name. So it's Ross Helmot. And I've put all links through to Ross's websites and so forth in the description of the video as well. Ross has been a professional guitar teacher for 30 plus years now. And he's also worked with beginners all the way through to professionals who come to him to learn more. And uh, he's got nothing but a lot of good comments from folks if you also look online. So he, I've known Ross for years. Ross was, I guess, the first real player I looked up to when I started playing out live. Um, and he was nice enough to sit in with my, my early stages of my band while I was clunking around. <laughs> so uh, thanks thanks for doing that for, for a while. That was always fun, mate. Yeah. We used to go to the jam nights, and that's where it all started for me, like, I never wanted to play. I didn't think I wanted to play in front of people at one point, but I was sort of forced into it and then I couldn't stop. And I guess doing this encourages you to learn and want to learn more about what, what it is you're actually doing. So Ross is one of the few guys I've ever met, like locally or anywhere really, that has an understanding of the guitar like he has. Um, and he's just finished a book with video content as well, which is available on Amazon. So if you go through to his website rosshelmot.com.au you can download his book and it's a P it's also like a pdf as well is that right or is it just a uh, it's just um just an ebook now yeah ebook okay e cool, cool. format awesome. yeah so it's on amazon um you can just download the kindle app and it'll it'll you can read it from there because it has the the video links attached so yeah yes yeah, yeah, format works best for that all right cool cool so if anyone else has any questions feel free to <laughs> LKJ says, I'm apologizing for asking. Oh, and I'm apologizing for apologizing. I'm Canadian, so I can't help it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I like Canadian. I hear they apologize a lot. So I went to Vancouver and I, I never noticed that, but I wasn't there for long enough, possibly. So Yeah. They've got nothing to apologize for in Canada, I think. Yeah, they're just too polite, maybe. Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. We can do with more of that in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So if, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to let me know. We can go for probably another 10 minutes or so um, before 
I've scheduled this to sort of finish around ten o'clock. If that's if that's cool with you, Ross. Yeah, it's cool with me, mate. Yeah. So we'll uh, we'll see if anyone else has any more music theory related stuff or any music questions that you might be interested in uh, checking out. But while we're waiting on these questions, I'll just fire up the website again, show you folks what where it is and all this kind of stuff. So let me grab this. Screen share always takes a second here. Mm. All right, so if you go to rosshelmot.com.au, yeah, this is his uh, website here. He also has a blog as well, so there's lots of good content on here. You can uh, click on different sections of the website and it will take you through to different things. And this is his blog here, so, oh, wow, man, you got a lot of, lot of posts, good stuff. Yeah, I didn't realise I had so many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it takes me ages to write. Seriously, I just go over every word and go back over it again. Yeah. It's, it's hard work. So this is the link here. If you click through on the book, Emmy Johnny's website, which makes it very, very easy, you can check out his, his book on Amazon here and a photo that was taken from our gig all these years ago. Have you still got that guitar, by the way? Yeah, I do, yeah. 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 Cool, yeah, I'm cool. not allowed to sell it. My brother won't let me. Yeah, I, I see you playing the the Telecasters more these days. Yeah, I like the Tele, and I've got a, um, a Strat that um, yeah, it's my, my butterfly Strat, you know, which is quite neat now, um, courtesy of my partner who, um, who like, likes little butterflies. So <laughs> yeah, we put it on the neck there, just on the headstock, and it's where the where the Fender emblem normally is. It's a bits and pieces. Uh, yeah, cool. With a piece of strat, but it's quite it's quite nice. So I use that for for some of the gigs I do. But the Tally's just a great all rounder. It's a great guitar as well. You know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, mine's, mine's a Jap, you know, a Jap um, Tally Fender, and um, just changed the pickups over, and it's it's a good little guitar. Yeah. So we did get one more question here. We got one from Dom Fran. He says, "Hi Shane and Ross. I'm a late joiner, but I have just one question. Um, what's your views on learning one style immersed?" Uh, instead of dabbling in lots of styles. Okay. Yeah, I think. Well, well, sometimes I think that if I could do that, I'd be a lucky person because I wouldn't have to worry about all this other stuff I'm trying to learn. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. For me, it's impossible. And I, I think, you know, for some guitar, well, some people are quite well direct. I've got a, um, a couple of friends and I, I who who do that, or they play one style. You know, they have a particular style, and it's their thing that they play that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's terrific because, um, you know, you know who they are when they're playing, you know, their, their identity and all that sort of thing. But even th those guys um, have an enormous, one guy in particular who, who uh, has played in a few major bands in this country. Um, but when you know what he listens to and what his favourite music is, it's way, way, way um, uh, out from, you know, what, what he actually plays, you know. Wow. He's got a bit of esoteric jazz things and, you know, you know we went and saw... Uh, Oh God! One of the great sax players about five or six years ago down at the Prince of Wales. You know that yeah, you just wouldn't think he would um, that that would be his thing. But you know he shares a love of Joni Mitchell's music, which with me as well. And um, you know we've been big Joni fans for a long, long time. So I think having at least immerse yourself, but 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 also open yourself up to other styles. You don't have to play it, but just listen because you can pick up ideas from that sort of thing. You know. I think um, yeah, yeah. Albert, Albert Lee actually talked about that. Long, I remember reading something of him, you know, and he he really immersed himself in that whole country thing and developing that sound of his. But but then Albert's gone out and played a lot of different things since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I think that's like that's kind of what I did. I, I knew like I wanted to play blues, and that's really it had to be a certain type of blues, and it had to be within this thing that I set up for myself. Maybe because it sounded like the most simple thing to learn at the time, but. If I had been listening to guys like Chris Kane, if I had have heard of him like 20 years ago and I thought, listen to this, I probably, I don't even know if I would have liked it back then because I, I, I don't, I'm not too sure. Your thing. <laughs> it was just different to, yeah, it was different to what I, I liked at the time. But if I had sort of been into that sort of, I don't want to say I'd be a much better player, but I probably would have a lot more creative ideas and a better understanding of the guitar if I if I had opened my, open the drawbridge of knowledge and, and, and music music through. You know, I have always listened to a lot of stuff, but when it came to to playing guitar, I was very narrow-minded for a long time. 
Yeah. It's only in like the last since I've been writing songs, I've kind of opened my my world up a whole lot more in 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 that way as well. But also in you know, I think sometimes it can almost be harder to learn sometimes the older you get to, or, or you know, for me to really want to learn, say the Chris Kane approach. That's all I would have to do for you know months, and yeah. it's a, it's a commitment thing too. So yeah, keep your keep your options open. And uh, we've got Skater Mum, who I think might be your your student. Says Shane, did you just refer to me as a he? Women play gu <laughs> women play guitar as well, you know. So I apologise for that. Yes, I'm, uh, yeah, don't 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 um, don't upset it. <laughs> if I showed you my demographics, you, you'd crack crack up there. It's really? like, yeah, it's ninety percent uh, male. Oh, <laughs> 95 percent male, I think. So. Oh, really? Yeah. It, it's something pretty funny like that. All right, here we go. Here we go. Just, just for last before we go, I'll, I'll show you guys this. So um, I don't know if you can see this all right, but we've got the green represents the women in that age group <laughs> and the blue represents the guys or the, the aqua or whatever color that is. So uh, you can get a, a sense of <laughs> how very few females there are. I think the... 13 to 17 years old is the is the, the largest female. Uh, oh, no, it's not. 18 to 24, maybe. Oh, no, it says female 14%. I don't know. Looks like they're contradicting themselves here and up here. But uh, anyway, yeah, so that's why I made that assumption. I apologize for that. Yeah, you might have to get the skater mum might get on board and subscribe as well, mate, so they might get an extra one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I know you guys are wrapping up, and I joined late. Uh, when you were talking about theory, did you illustrate using a guitar? No, we haven't. We've been talking about concepts and everything that, yeah, it's stuff that Ross has covered in his um, ebook as well. So I've posted all the links in the description, and before you go, oh man, I need to see something visually. There's videos along with it as well. Yeah, videos there as well. That for that reason, yeah, and hopefully, hopefully that helps. You know. Um, yeah, it's um, if it if there's stuff you need to see extra video, have a look at the book, um, look at the video. I've also got a um, a um, little Facebook page on the book there as well. So um, and just make a comment on there if you want to see a bit more video. At some stage, I might put a little bit more stuff up on on that as well. Yeah. The, the idea of it's so that you can apply it to the guitar. So I, I get that you need to see it. Um, yeah, sometimes in the book it's just too 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 far removed. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's why I put the video in there. Yeah, and like I said earlier, for those who were just joining, I know that I can vouch for the videos because I was shot here. <laughs> so yes, uh, if you're wondering how, how they'll look or sound, they'll be like my uh, regular YouTube demos. Oh, well, actually probably better than that. So you definitely definitely check out Ross's stuff. So thanks so much for, for jumping on, having a chat about this. It's been interesting. And I know myself, this... There's so much to learn on guitar, and I think what you've done is given people the easy approach to learning the concepts through, I guess, a wide variety of things. Okay, mate. Thanks for having me tonight. It's been terrific. It's good, good to catch up again. No worries. No worries. So thanks to... Person soon. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks to everyone who was watching. I appreciate all your comments and questions, and uh, yeah, we'll catch you on the next stream. Cool. Okay, mate.